Hello, everybody. Uh, just uh, hope you are doing well. Well, my name is Eduardo Garza. I'm a regional sales manager for Mexico and South America for Balco. As you know, Balco is a leader company who design and manufacture high quality products for poultry, swine, dairy industries, etc. Balco is doing these webinars activities to provide information and support to all dealers and distributors around the world. Thank you for taking the time to log in the webinar. We appreciate it. Today, our speaker is Doug Berkey, product engineer with support from Mike Fulham from the tech support team. They are located in Coldwater, Ohio. Doug is going to talk us about the different options for heating. Please, if you have any question during the presentation, use the chat option to send your request. And at the end, I will ask Doug about it. In Balco, we are doing everything possible to support you and your customers in these difficult times. Doc, it's your time. Go ahead. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar for Heating with Balco. Uh, definitely appreciate uh, everyone taking part in this and taking time out of your schedules uh, with this. So we'll, we'll get started with uh, heating and options for heating within Balco. And there are, there are different types of options with heating where you have uh, radiant brooders, you have radiant tube heat, or space heaters or box fans or you know, forced air units as, as uh, people are known to them. And one question we have of you know, heating, why do we need to add heating um, to the birds? Uh, why do we need to add supplemental heating? And part of the reason is of that with chicks, when they're first born, in the first so many days up to maybe a week old, seven days old, um, they're not able to produce or control their own body temperature. They're able to not control their own body temperature. And since their mother isn't there to kind of keep that body warmth with them, uh, it's necessary to supply that additional heat for them. It keeps them uh, alive. It keeps them able to grow uh, properly. And it's definitely a known fact that, you know, any stress on a chick can have a negative performance uh, and throughout the life of their cycle. And not having the proper body heat for them um, will cause a lot of stress on those chicks. So as we go forth and talk about the different component, uh, the different types of heating, uh, one option is, there are two options actually, is forced air or infraradiant. Uh, forced air, again, you have your box heaters or your, or what you call the space heater. And those operate by warming the air in the barns. Um, and then usually that air will float upward, stratifying inside the, the heat inside the barn, you know, as heat rises, um, it, again, you're just, warming the air itself. Infrared heaters, they operate by radiating heat to the floor and the birds or to other objects in the barn uh, with less stratification. And as the heat slowly comes off the floor into the air, so it stays on the objects themselves, more the birds and the floor. Um, you also, with the forced air, comparing to an infraradiant brooder, um, you have with the forced air, you have fewer appliances to work with to maintain the service, but the heat transfer with them with the stratification is, is very poor because again, you're working with the air and not the objects. Um, and because of their heating all the air in the barn, they will use more fuel. And uh, so obviously more fuel is more cost along with it. And they also, they create a draft since it's actual air movement they're creating a draft over the animals, and that's typically not what you would prefer uh, in your barn. Infraradiant brooders, they have a much better heat pattern because they're heating the floor. They're heating right where the animals are, right where the birds are. Um, and with that, they're, since they are not heating the air, they're using less fuel. Um, also, since there are multiple units inside one barn, you know, to heat the, the floor in, a, in, a, in the proper pattern, there are more backup units if one unit fails. So if one stops operating for some unknown reason, 
then you have the other units that are still keeping the temperature going inside the barn itself. Um, they also have less obstruction for you when you have when you're in the middle of tunnel ventilation. They're not against the wall blocking that air from moving. Um, they have a better design to them where the air goes over them much smoothly. Now the negative is there are more units to maintain. Um, so when you're servicing them, you have to clean them. They're obviously there are more units to work with. So between flocks, it's just a little bit more maintenance time with them. Um, when you're describing brooders and using them in the house, how many do you need in a house? Uh, and based off of how the heat patterns you need in the barn, you know, what kind of coverage you're getting for, um, that, that, that all indicates what you need to do for the proper coverage in your brood chambers or your brood sections. Uh, very common spacing uh, is 10 meters on center of each brooder. And you will normally stagger those side to side um, to, as you see in this picture here, to get a better coverage on your floor. Um, and that's in the brooding section, and they're spaced further apart in the non brood area of the barn. And you know, one thing to follow is uh, in a temperate climate, um, you can kind of roughly say you need 500 to 600 BTUs per square meter on the floor in the brooding area. 300 to 400 BTUs per square meter in the non brood area. With the brooders, you have different ignition types. Um, we have standalone units that are, you know, they use a sit control valve, and those have pilot flames um, to keep the operation, the unit operating, and uh, there's no electricity required for those. And the, the, the Gas valve acts as its own thermostat. It's an onboard unit that you control manually. Um, they are less expensive to purchase, but there is no automatic adjustment. As the birds grow, as they get older, you, you, need, you need to supply less and less heat throughout the life. Um, so you would have to manually go through and adjust each of those brewers with these uh, uh, pilot units. We also offer the direct spark models where it is 24 volts AC required to operate them. And they can be operated by your whole house controller, which is using your temp sensors. They are more expensive to purchase, but they, they do save fuel. So they're saving that cost savings throughout the life. And again, they can be operated more uh, automatically with your, with your uh, whole house control. Uh, in different areas around the world where you have different altitudes above sea level. Um, you need to pay attention to that with what you're installing with your brooders, what kind of brooders you're purchasing. If your area is above a thousand meters above sea level, the, the uh, oxygen balance, the air mixture is, is different. So that affects how the units will, will burn efficiently. So you need to use a different size uh, orifice to make sure that the mixture, the, the fuel and air mixture is, is set accordingly to operate these properly. Normally in older units, um, you would simply use a smaller BTU, you use roughly 30,000 BTU heat it, heat, excuse me, heaters to make up for that uh, change in oxygen needed. Uh, but with our Aurora units we have now, we have what we call butane units, which is normally if you have a higher elevation area, the, the fuel mixture does normally contain more butane in it to burn properly. So we have uh, adjusted the orifice sizes inside the brooders accordingly, and we do have these models available. With the brooders, you, there are different canopies to work with. We have aluminum canopy and a galvanized canopy. With the aluminum, it's more reflective. So it helps uh, direct that radiant heat down to the objects, the floor and the birds. The aluminum is also lighter. So when shipping comes into effect and you're looking at kind of weight costs, the aluminum canopy would be better for that aspect. But in general, the material itself is more expensive than a galvanized steel. Again, the galvanized would not be as expensive and they also are a more rigid components um, so they are less prone to damage you know if, if a, a piece of equipment is going by them it's less possibility of the 
the canopy from being bent or dented um, with the galvanized units over the aluminum. Other options, if you want to compare you know, infant radiant brooders, there's also radiant tube heat as well. well if you're comparing those two, the radiant brooders, um, again, as we said before, there are uh, more units in a barn that if, if one seems to fail, you have others backing it up. You have others that are still operating. You're not losing as much uh, possibility of heat. But because you have more brooders, there are more units, again, to maintain, to service throughout the life of them. But we do have, again, the higher altitude models with the brooders, the Aurora brooders. Tube heat, uh, given there's, there's usually only a few in a barn, depending on how you situate your, uh, your install, that there's fewer appliances to maintain. Uh, so with the brooders, you have more units, you're putting more work into them between flocks or even during the flock. But with tube heaters, there's uh, fewer units. So you do not have to worry about putting as much time and effort into maintaining them. They do although have a better fuel usage and they have a low intensity uh, infraradiant that penetrates the surfaces better than what brooders are known for high intensity readers. Although we do not have high altitude models available with the tube heat. And as I was talking with the infrared, talking about the brooders or the heat tube heaters, um, you know, high intensity, low intensity, we can go, what, what really is infrared? So you talk about what infrared is and it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And infrared heating, is is the option of you know it, it's the opportunity to transmit the energy through in, into objects through the electric magnetic waves or what the rays would be and it has a way you know different there are different wavelengths uh, through different types of infrared and as we talk about the infrared heating is the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum differentiates all types of electromagnetic wave energy through the the wavelength measured in microns. The wavelengths of spectrum has a very wide range from very short wavelengths of the cosmic rays to a much longer wavelength, such as the broadcast radio wave rays. Infrared energy has a wavelength slightly longer than visible light, um, having wavelengths of 0.7 to 400 microns. And it's definitely good to remember that the infrared wavelengths are well beyond the harmful X and UV rays given. As we discussed, the radiant spectrum, um, again, as I was saying earlier, radiant brooders usually have a higher intensity wavelength and the radiant tube heaters have a lower intensity. And the difference normally is, is based upon the emitter temperature, uh, such as the high intensity the emitter under brooders are approximately a thousand degrees Celsius, and the emitter temperature for a low intensity, uh, such as a two heater, is approximately 550 degrees Celsius. This gives the length of the wavelengths are directly related to those surface temps. So, as the higher temp of the emitter, um, the the shorter the wavelength. And objects such as concrete, or water, or people absorb longer wavelengths better and more effectively than shorter wavelengths. So typically with wavelengths for high intensity are between one to six microns, but the low intensity wavelengths are between two and 10 microns. And so more of the energy generated from the low intensity heaters are more efficiently, effectively used to heat the objects in the barn because the, again, the objects will absorb a longer wavelength better. Uh, the distribution is another thing to look for, again, as that is radiating to the objects. Um, the low intensity heater, uh, it distributes that, that, again, with the wavelengths, it distributes the heat better than a high intensity. And normally, high intensity heaters are generally unvented heaters, whereas the low intensity, such as the tube heaters, those can be, those normally are vented you know, outward of the, of the facilities. We definitely want to remember that for every 300 kilowatts per hour of heat input will result in 37.8 liters of water vapor released into the space. And that causes you know, more difficulty uh, to control with general ventilation. Uh, the effective heating zone with brooders, uh, 
you normally with the, whether it be the glow radiant or the aurora brooders, you have approximately an eight meter diameter heat pattern on the floor. Whereas on the tube heaters, uh, it's not around, obviously it's a, it's a straight line pattern, but normally your heat pattern is one and a half times the height of the unit itself. So say you have the heater set at uh, three meters, your heat pattern, the width of the heat pattern on the floor is going to be four and a half meters. So it, it gives a, a real good efficient heat pattern on the floor itself through the tube heater. And there has been different research and studies on these and one uh, school that is, is, does a lot of studying through the poultry side of things is the uh, University of Georgia. And they, throughout the years, they have always been known to do uh, a lot of training, a lot of uh, studies on different heat patterns, different ventilation uh, equipment. And uh, they hand that out with people and they, they're very useful uh, with the ag community. And they do different testing. Again, as we say, we have results where um, we have a chart here. They, they show in a month of February, comparing warm air with um, radiant brooders, also along with tube heat. Um, the tube heat used 21% less fuel to warm the house and 17% less fuel than the brooders. This is not usual because usually you get higher savings with that. It's just it may have been a different temperate uh, climate that they were at at that time. With brooders and two peters, as you're trying to preheat the barns before the birds are placed, um, infrared heaters, they cover a larger area to heat the objects versus a space heater or forced air. Uh, so they'll raise the floor temperatures within a matter of hours. Uh, forced air heaters, again, they're not warming the, just the area that the birds are in, they're warming the entire barn. So they, they may take days to, to, to uh, preheat the barn. And as we move on, there are uh, different uh, infraradiant pictures, infrared pictures of how barns are heated with different units. Uh, as we see here, uh, this picture is showing how the uh, building is being heated with box heaters or space heaters. This is after 20 minutes. And you can see that the floor, it, it's an it's a even temperature, but it's not very high. After 20 minutes, the, the temperature is roughly only 18 degrees Celsius. As we move on to a similar picture with radiant brooders, um, you can see here where you have heat patterns on the floor from the brooders below them, where it, it heats up the floor itself much quicker. This picture here is shown after 10 minutes. Uh, the result shows how you have a higher temperature in those areas on the floor versus what you saw in the previous slide with uh, forced air heaters. And this here, you can see where it's, uh, it's roughly 32 degrees Celsius in those spots under the brooders. As we move on, we have another picture of using infrared tube heaters as well. Um, you have a much larger heat pattern. The floor is warmer up in different areas. And again, this is after 10 minutes as well. And you can see how quickly the tube heaters can place a more uniform heat pattern on the floor. Um, again, this in, in 10 minutes, this is 26 degrees Celsius over a good uh, larger area of the floor pattern. And this will allow the birds, given there's more heat dispersed across a wider pattern, they'll allow the birds to move more freely and roam a little bit more as you would like. With that being done with the, with the slide presentation there, hopefully we uh, would you have any questions, as Eduardo said earlier, go ahead and put them on the chat board and we can uh, discuss those. And right now, I'm also, we can discuss those along with questions that may pop up. I'm also going to uh, go over an actual brooder and show how to maintain it, how to clean the different components with that, with that brooder. So as we do that, we can go to a, the video here. Uh, see, we have an Aurora brooder here. And with the Aurora, as we discussed, we, it, we have the higher altitudes and good components, but another unit, another aspect with this heater is the design of it. It's more uh, spacious, more uh, compact design, if you want to say, uh, where other units, they may be taller and they have uh, components further down below the heating unit, where between flocks, when you're cleaning your barns out, um, that space is, can be very important. 
as you raise the, the heaters out of the way and you're bringing the equipment through, any excess spacing you have below this could in, uh, interact with the equipment you use to clean your barn. So the shorter we can get these, the more space you have for your equipment. As we discuss this here, as I do have a sit control unit on here, um, it's going to have a pilot on it. Um, as we all spin that around right here, we have a, a standalone unit. And I want to describe different components of this and how we want to clean this. Um, as you can see, we have a thermocouple right here at the brooder going in near the pilot shield. So we have your pilot flame, your pilot gas line right here. And you have your burn, your main burn orbs and gas line as well. So when you're cleaning things, you can get dust built up and get uh, spider webs, what have you, inside these units. So we want to be able to clean the orifices accordingly. So I'm going to start with the pilot orifice. I'm going to remove the thermocouple. And the pilot shield is held in by clips. So I'm going to raise that up, try to work that out of there, and remove that. As you can see, it has little hooks in it that fit inside these slots in there. So it just, you place it in there and kind of drop it in place. So I, I lift that up, I remove the pilot shield. Now you can see the pilot orifice is very small and normally on all, all of our brooders, that's a, more like a number 78 drill size. So to properly clean that, since it is so small, I'm gonna use a clean out drill. I'm gonna grab the proper size. Actually, I'm gonna go one size smaller to make sure that I do not open up the orifice uh, improperly. If you, when you're using a drill, a clean out drill, and it may be difficult to see this, it's very small unit, especially given it's for pilot orifices. Um, given that the orifice is a soft material, usually a brass material, that you do not want to use a drill that's too big, or and you want to be careful not to be rough with cleaning this out because you can enlarge that hole. You do not want to open that orifice too big because you'll have the wrong amount of fuel coming through there. So I will get that drill inside there. Very difficult to see since it's so small, but I can just very lightly spin that drill bit inside there. I can clean that out, make sure there's nothing inside of that little orifice there. So we have that cleaned out. And we also want to be able to remove the burner orifice as well. So there, I'm going to take that pilot, since we cannot get to it, I have to remove the whole elbow based on that. So I want to remove the gas line. And when we do that on any of these fittings, you want to make sure that you're using two wrenches. One, to hold the fitting itself so you do not bend it, you do not uh, damage it at all. And the other wrench is used to loosen the, the nuts for the pipes. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one off. Sometimes these will loosen up enough. You can use your fingers loose and I can feel this has a little bit tight to it yet. Okay, now I have that nut loose. I'm going to pull the gas line out of it. Now I can thread the elbow out of the burner assembly. And you see the orifice is much larger because that's where the vast majority of your heat is coming from. All your fuel and everything's coming through the main burner orifice. That is a much larger opening, so I do not need to use a small clean-out drill. What I will do is I will use compressed air to clean that. And every time you want to do that, make sure you're using the proper safety equipment. Use the safety glasses. So I will simply again, use compressed air. To clean, to clean that orifice out. Now we're good. That is nice and cleaned out, so we're ready to go for that one. I'm going to leave that off for now as we're going to clean 
the uh, cash burner assembly as well. And given that I, I want to remove that whole assembly, we still have a pilot line um, connected in there. So I want to remove that guy, that pilot line. So I want to use two wrenches, one on the fitting and one on the, the gas line nut. Always want to make sure you're holding that fitting in place. That way you're not twisting it or damaging it again. Okay. Make sure. Yeah, I got that removed. So I'm going to remove that pilot gas line. Now, everything is, is free of the orifices and everything, so I can go ahead. There's three nuts that hold that burner assembly in place. So I want to remove those three nuts of securing everything. And as these come loose, um, make sure you're supporting this uh, whole assembly just in case it might try to drop down. You don't want to damage anything. They're just tight. These do get somewhat tight at times. So again, you may, you may need to kind of force these off. Sometimes it takes a little bit because heat changes, affects the unit themselves. Loosen this up. There's a nut inside here that will loosen that up just a little bit. That allows this to become a little bit more loose. I can hear it drop. There we go. Now we have the whole burn casting assembly removed. And we want to make sure you can clean all of those venturis out, those, those uh, openings, those gaps in there for the fuel to flow through properly. Again, I'll do that right there. Blow everything out. You do not use, need to use real high pressurized air. You can do this with compressed air. We have that. We'll set that aside as we want to make sure that we have the emitter clean as well and underneath the canopy. Um, if these are not cleaned out, they may not heat up properly. You get a poor, efficiently uh, operating unit. It could cause soot to build up at times, and you definitely do not want to do that. So, again, I'm going to use lightly compressed air. Blow inside here. Blow around there. Make sure everything is clean. You can blow underneath the canopy as well if there is any dirt build up on it. So now we can put everything back together. And as we notice, um, I want to make sure that I put this back in the same direction it was. This can be rotated different ways, but make sure that the pilot was I want to put it back in the same manner that it came off. So I'm going to secure these on there. Sometimes you can get uh, two of these started to hold it in place. That one. Situate this so that I can get that started in there as well. I had that loosened up a little bit before. I may I may need to loosen that early, that not a little bit more, just be able to adjust that accordingly. There we go. That started. Tighten all these down. I want to remember to tighten the nut I had inside here that I loosened to get that to fit. 
All right, everything is tight. Now I can put the, uh, the pipes and the orifices back on. So I'll put the burner orifice on here real quick. Thread it back in there. Get that situated. I'm going to put the pilot gas line back in the fitting as well there. Start to thread the nut on there. Be careful not to cross thread these. As again, it's a soft material. Um, you don't want to damage the threads on there. Make sure as it's getting tight, I want to make sure I'm using that wrench to hold it in place so I'm not spinning it or damaging it. As you tighten these down, they don't need to be too tight. You can damage them if you make them too tight. So I'm going to just kind of snug them up. Now I'm going to put on the burner gas line as well. Get that started. Okay, I'm going to hold that in place. And the reason, again, holding this that way, I'm not bending anything. This is going into a piece of sheet metal. I don't want to bend this by putting too much pressure on that nut. Okay. Right, the gas line's back in place. I want to put the thermocouple. Actually, I want to, no. Before I put the thermocouple in, I want to make sure I put our pilot shield back in. Remember, we have those hooks on there. So we place those in the slots in the holder. Get that to drop in place. There we go. Put the thermocouple back in place because that would be near the pilot shield. You want to make sure that's where the flame of the pilot is directing it right at that thermocouple. So now that we have everything going, we can try to, we can ignite it and make sure it burns off properly. But before we really burn it, I want to make sure that my gas pressures or I don't have any leaks at my fittings. Um, so first I'm going to turn gas pressure on. I'm going to set my control unit to pilot. And what I want to do is to check for gas leaks, you want to use a soapy water solution to spray on the fittings and see if any bubbles arise as the gas pressure is coming through. If there are bubbles, that means there's a leak and you definitely do not want to have any leaks. So you want to make sure that the fittings are properly tightened. So as I'm going to supply the, spraying that, I have the pilot gas going. I do not see any bubbles going on there. So we're good. So I will light the pilot. It may take, since we had that apart, there may be air in it, so it may, it may flicker like this a little bit. It may have to try to light it a couple different times. It's just purging that air through the line. And I'm holding this control knob down. That's allowing the pilot fuel to come through and only the pilot as I'm setting on that setting. And what that does, I gotta keep that fuel going so it heats up that thermocouple. It's a safety device. If that thermocouple is not heated properly and you let go of the control, the whole unit shuts off. Again, it's a safety issue. I'm going to give it a little bit of time to heat that thermocouple up. Release the knob so we are now operating. I'm going to turn on the burner itself. You can see we're burning nice and blue and efficient, so I'm going to spray a little bit right here. I do not see any bubbles forming on that, so I have those fittings adjusted accordingly. You see nice blue flames coming around there. It's burning very nicely, very efficiently. Things appear to be working very good. So we went through the cleaning process. Things are operating nicely. And as this heats up, you'll see the radiant, the emitter start to glow red, and that is what is radiating the heat down to the objects, the floor and the birds itself. As we go through, we have different air components, so I'm talking, waving things through. And then 
uh, everything is looking very nice. You see it glowing red, you see it operating very well. Looks good. See, in just in that short period of time, how that started to, to glow red accordingly, and then we'll heat the objects on the floor, and now we're operating properly. Go ahead and turn that off. Shut our gas supply off. And that's how you maintain your brooders accordingly. Um, now we're open to any questions anyone may have. Hey, Doc. Uh, we, yes. have one, we have one question here. Yes. They say, uh, if you need to recommend a uh, birds per brooder, how many, how many birds per brooder do you recommend? And also, <clears throat> uh, the height, uh, the recommend height for uh, the, that kind of brooder? Uh, normally with brooders, and it's all stated in the manual, the height and the recommendation around clearance to combustibles. Um, the height, Normally, in domestic, we would use roughly five to six feet off the floor, um, which is what? Uh, 1.5 meters. 1 .5 meters yeah. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So that's roughly where you start with the, the radiant brooders. Um, as to how many birds per, again, it's, it, that may differ in the different climates. Um, and I think we discussed earlier, it's more of how many BTUs per square meter we discussed earlier in the slide where I think in the brood chamber, I believe it was 500 to 600 uh, BTUs per square meter. Uh, so you don't necessarily always look at how many birds per brooder. It's, it's difficult to say that because again, they vary so much depending on what height you have, um, what, uh, what type of climate you're in. Okay, yes, he, he also write that, that he understand that it was a tough uh, question, so, uh, but he want to ask that. That's fine, that's a good question, that's, that's, that's fine. And it is what we have right now, so it's not more questions there, and we are done. Okay, I appreciate everyone taking part in this, and I hope it's definitely well worth your time and uh, please if you have any questions you know feel free to contact Balco at any time we'll be we're here to help everyone and and make sure things are working op operating for you and we have the proper equipment for you as well so uh, thank you very much and everyone have a good day thank you doc thank you everybody to attend this and stay healthy bye-bye